grace and peace to you this day. Welcome to worship here at Park Church. My name is Caleb Sadam. I'm the pastor here at Park Church. And I'm so happy to be here with you on this Trinity Sunday. The one Sunday a year where the church likes to make sure that its pastors are actually talking about the great mystery that is the Holy Trinity. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. How these, these three can be one and these one can be three. And I can promise you by the end of this worship service, you will... Well, you, you might not have a better grasp on the Holy Trinity, but that's okay because the Trinity is such a massive mystery that none of us can understand it. We're just tiny, limited human beings, and God is, well, so unimaginably immense and complicated that we can't ever truly hope to understand God. But what I can promise you is that by the end of this service, that you will hopefully have had the opportunity to have a real experience of this triune God. Also, today is part of Memorial Day weekend here in the U.S., a day where we, we commemorate and we, give, we pay our respects to those who have died in the course of war. We think of our members of the armed services here in the U.S., particularly for this holiday, but really any life lost in war is a tragedy. And as Christians, we not only commemorate the, these losses, but we pray for war to truly end so that no one anywhere ever needs to honor or mourn a fallen soldier, sailor, airman, or marine anywhere in the world ever again. So let us prepare our hearts and our minds to worship God this day. Let us prepare with these words. All who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. Praise be to you, O Holy One. You have given us a spirit of adoption. When we cry, to, when we cry Abba, Father, it is the very Spirit testifying that we are children of God. Praise be to you, O Holy One, for you have made us joint heirs with Christ. All who suffer in solidarity with Christ Jesus are glorified with him. Praise be to you, O holy one in three. We gather in your most blessed name. Let us pray. We long to live eternally with you, O God. Send forth your Holy Spirit that we may be born from above, healed in Christ, and raised to new life in your loving presence. For you are one in mind, one in will, one in purpose, our triune God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Friends, how will we ascribe glory to the Lord if we fail to hear God's holiness, if we fail to fear God's holiness? How shall we fear God's holiness if we fail to acknowledge our sin? With humility and faith, let us express to God our dismay at our own sin and our satisfaction with ourselves as participants in the sin of the world through our prayer of confession. Let us pray. Holy God, we confess that we live unclean lives. Unless you touch us, we are lost. Unless you save us, we are condemned. Yet you have declared that your you have declared that your purpose in sending Christ Jesus is not for us, but for the whole world. Free us, O God, from our countless fears. Forgive us, O Lord, for our tendency toward the flesh. Impart to us your Holy Spirit that Christ might be formed in us for your glory and majesty and honor. Amen. Friends, I tell you truthfully, the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting, and so is the Lord's mercy and love and forgiveness. I declare to you that we are God's forgiven people through the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Amen. Let us go to God in prayer as we prepare to encounter the word of God read and proclaimed. God of all life, give us understanding of your word. Make your spirit to illuminate the scripture and transform us by it. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. We have two scripture readings this morning. The first is from John chapter 3, verses 1 through 17. Listen now for the word of God. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. 
He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify of what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you, did, and you do not believe, then how can, I how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who has descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him it may not perish, but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And our second reading comes from the letter to the Romans, chapter 8, verses 12 through 17. So then, brothers and sisters, we are debtors, not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, then you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very Spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if in fact we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Imagine what you would feel like if you were told tomorrow that your long-lost, rich, great-aunt Gertrude had died and left you a sizable portion of her huge estate. Like a massive portion. So large, you will never have to earn another dime for the rest of your life. You wake up one morning and all of your financial concerns are completely taken care of. And you really don't have to worry about much of anything for the rest of your life. Now, in this scenario, how would you feel? What would you do? Or more importantly, what would you do differently? What would be different about your day-to-day? Your -day? What would change about your attitudes, your behaviors, your perceptions, your decisions? How would knowing your future is absolutely secure change your present? The question is really an important one because Paul describes this very scenario in Romans. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs, the heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. According to Paul, we are not just children of God, but we are heirs of God, not just heirs, but co-heirs along with Christ. We inherit all of the riches that God has. And what's more, we have no need to be afraid. We should not fear the future what people think of us, or anything at all. And Paul invites us instead to imagine a life of courage, the kind of courage that comes from being adopted by God and brought into the full measure of God's riches. Which brings us to the Holy Trinity. Yeah, I know I made kind of a hard turn there, but just, just stick with me. The Holy Trinity, or one God in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, is one of the most crucial, yet one of the least understood doctrines of the faith. It is one of what is called the great mysteries of faith. 
And mysteries of the faith, by definition, cannot fully be understood by humans. Uh, and we don't like that. We can't stand not knowing things. We demand clarity and a clear, logical explanation. And Christians have been trying for nearly 2,000 years to explain the Holy Trinity. One such Christian who devoted a huge portion of his life to trying to explain the Trinity was a great theologian, St. Augustine of Hippo, who lived in northern Africa in the 4th century. He was born in the year 354. And he was arguably the most brilliant theologian in the history of the church. And, its te and his teachings have played a huge role in forming, in forming theological thought, at least in the Western church, for going on 17 centuries now. Truly one of the greatest theologians in the history of the church. Now, Augustine decided he was going to develop an understandable explanation for the mystery of the Holy Trinity, the God that is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He spent 30 years working on this. And one day he was taking a walk along the beach of the Mediterranean Sea, lost in thought, contemplating the Trinity, trying to make sense of it. And he looked up ahead of him and he saw a small boy who kept running back and forth to the water's edge and then going back to a, a spot in the sand and back and forth and back and forth, back and forth. And as he got closer, he saw the little boy had a seashell that he would fill up with water and then he'd run back to a little hole that he had dug in the sand and he'd pour that water into the hole. And then he'd run back to, the, back to the, the water and get more and come back and do it again and again and again and again. And he watched the boy doing this for a bit, and then he walked up to the kid and asked, what are you doing? The boy looked up, smiled, and said, I'm trying to bring the whole sea into this hole. Augustine said, but, but that's impossible. This little hole cannot contain all of that water. The little boy stood up, looked square in Augustine's eyes, and replied, it is no more impossible than what you are trying to do, comprehend the immensity of the mystery of the Holy Trinity with your small intelligence. Augustine was kind of dumbstruck. He looked away from the boy for a brief moment. When he looked back, the boy had vanished. And sure tradition says this boy was either an angel or Christ himself who was sent to remind Augustine of the limits of human understanding when it comes to the great mysteries of our faith. I don't fully understand the Trinity, and I don't believe that it's possible for any human being to understand the Trinity of this side of heaven. God is simply too vast for our minds to grab hold of. And I think that it's because we can't fully figure out the Trinity, and by and large, we fail to think about it at all. And we do this at our own peril, because when we ignore the Trinity, we ignore the reality of the existence of the God that we profess the one that we worship, the one that we serve. And then we truly abandon any hope of knowing just who it is that we worship. The doctrine of the Trinity is, is too vast to cover in one sermon. It's, it's truly too vast to cover in a million sermons. But I know that at the heart of any understanding, even the most basic understanding of the Trinity, is relationship. God has existed as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit since the very beginning. The Trinity is a community in a constant loving relationship with one another. From the very beginning, the very essence of God has always been loving relationship. If we want to grasp even the faintest conception of the Trinity, we must think in terms of love that is shared. God exists as a community of love. God is inherently in God's very existence, relational. The love that is present in the very existence of God was poured out in the creation of the world, and, and we were created to increase the level of relationship in the world. The love of God yearned for more things to be in relationship with. Humans were created to walk along with God and, and, and be in relationship with God. And now, after Jesus Christ ascended through the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, God did the amazing thing of giving us his love. And I'm not talking about God having the warm and fuzzy feelings about us. No, through the grace of Jesus Christ and by the power of the Holy Spirit, we actually have been given the very love that is the very core of God and involves us in God's own life. And that's the truly amazing thing. 
God chooses to involve us in the love that is shared within the Trinity. God could just sit up there in heaven and just be content to keep the love to God's own self. But through the outpouring of the Spirit, God brings us into God's own life. And this is the new birth that Jesus is talking about to Nicodemus in John chapter 3. The gift of being truly transformed by the love of the triune God. The love of God, the love that is God, comes out to us by the power of the Holy Spirit. And when we say that the Spirit is within us, we are not just saying that the Spirit hangs around with us, you know, follows around on our shoulder or something like that, guiding us and illuminating the Bible to us. No, the Holy Spirit unites us with and makes us into the image of God because we now have become involved in the actual life of God. So the church of God is then made up of people that have been adopted by God and who have the same love for God within them. And that love of God calls us together. And since we are brought together by the, the love of the, of the triune God, we are called to have the same kind of relationship with each other that has always existed between the three persons of the Trinity. We are to love one another truly. We are to open our hearts to each other and welcome each other into our hearts. We are to treat each other with respect and dignity because the, because the love cannot motivate someone to treat other Christians with contempt. You know, maybe our deficient understanding of the doctrine of Trinity is, well, is really to blame for why the church across the world has such a hard time getting along. Maybe if we realize that the only reason we call ourselves Christians is that the love of God the love in God's own heart, the love that is God's own existence, called us together. Maybe if we understood that, we might be a little bit more reluctant to eviscerate each other over everything from theology to the color of the carpet in the sanctuary, or hold a grudge over a mistake someone committed 20 years ago. Maybe if we realized the powerful love of God was in us, we'd, we'd treat each other a little better. We have in us the very love of God that is the existence of God. We have it through the power of the Holy Spirit, with, which enters into our heart. And it changes us, making us the children of God by drawing from our lips the very cry of Abba, Father. By that same Spirit, we are united with Jesus Christ, the incarnate Son, and, and, and He will ascend, and when we will ascend to the Father just as He ascended, and we will inherit just as He inherited which is eternity in the very life of God. Where Christ has gone is where we will go. And Christ in the ascension has gone into the eternal life of God. That is the glory of being a child of God and a co-heir with Christ. That the God of the universe, before whom the very angels veil their faces, gives of God's own life to make us a part of that life. This is our inheritance. This is what we have, and this is what we will always have. So I ask you again, what are you going to do? Or more importantly, what are you going to do differently? What is going to be different about your day-to-day? -day? What's going to change about your attitudes, your behaviors, your perceptions, your decisions? How does knowing your future is absolutely secure change your present. What difference does it make knowing that you will forever have God's love within you? How does it change your life knowing you have the life of God within you? Let us pray. Gracious God, may we never forget how remarkable you are and how amazing it is that you have brought us into your very existence. Grow in us until that is no longer we who live, but you who live through us. In Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. Let us together affirm what we believe to the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, 
was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead, and he ascended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Friends, we now come to the time where we can lift our concerns to God in prayer. Let us pray. Almighty God, who taught us to pray not only for ourselves, but for people everywhere, hear us as we pray for others in the name of Jesus Christ. Inspire the whole church with your power, your unity, and your peace. Grant that all who trust you may obey your word and live together in love. Lead all nations in the way of justice and goodwill. Direct those who govern that they may rule fairly, maintain order, uphold those in need, and defend oppressed people. That this world may claim your rule and know true peace, and that we may know war no more. Awaken all people to the danger that we have inflicted upon the earth. Implant in each a reverence for all you have made, that we may preserve the delicate balance of creation for all coming generations. Give grace to all who proclaim the gospel through word and sacrament and deeds of mercy, that by their teaching and example, they may reveal your love for all people. Comfort and relieve, O Lord, all who are in trouble, who are in sorrow, in poverty, in sickness, in grief, especially those known to us whom we name now before you in silence. Heal them in body, mind, or circumstance, working in them by your grace wonders beyond all they may dream or hope. Bring to our remembrance all those who, having served you on earth, now sing your praises eternally. May their endurance give us courage and their faithfulness give us hope. All this we pray through the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, we have been transformed and we give all that we are to Christ. For God has given all that God is to us. So let us give of our prayers, of our kind words to one another, of our actions to one another, and of the gifts of the material nature. If you can continue to support your local congregation financially, we thank you very much and we encourage you to continue to do so. But if you cannot afford to continue that, that's okay because that's just one of many ways that you work to build the kingdom of God here on earth. Let us pray. Lord, there is nothing more precious than our relationship with you. When we are sad and unsure, you join on our journey and remind us of your saving love. When we urge you to stay, you come and break bread with us, opening our eyes to you, to life, to resurrection hope. Take these gifts given in faith, bless them and use them so that others will come to see you alongside them in their deepest distress. Amen. Friends, go knowing that you are loved by God, that you have the love of God in your very being, and that love is God's very being. So go and give that love to everyone. And may your every single day be changed by the knowledge of this amazing mystery. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine on you and give you grace. Grace not to sell yourself short, but grace to risk something big for something good. Grace enough to know the world is now too small for anything but the truth and too terrified for anything but love. May God take your minds and think through them. God take your lips and speak through them. God take your hands and work through them. God take your hearts and set them on fire. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen.